let's get this conversation started. My pronouns are she or hers. My name is Stephanie Janessa de Altamirano. And as you can see from my bio, I was originally born and raised in Honduras, Tegucigalpa, which is the capital. And so I've gotten to see firsthand um, the effects of climate change on third world countries, which is something very prominent that a lot of people talk about as the first um, changes will be, we will be seeing across the globe within climate change affecting the most marginalized and vulnerable groups across you know, communities. So having that stated, um, I will explain you a little bit more how the Youth Climate Action Team started. Um, back in high school, I had uh, founded the Green Club at my high school. And while we were doing very productive work, uh, we were planting trees, we were picking up trash, we were even cleaning up and remodeling our greenhouse. It was small scale community solutions. And I definitely wanted to take it to a larger scale where the whole Madison community could get involved. And at the time, Greta Thunberg was such an inspiration to like a lot of environmentalists. And I wanted to create the next, or at least like somehow plan the next climate strike. And it was just me with like other five people in my green club, uh, members who were like full on boarding, trying to figure out how we could facilitate this. Um, as you can see, we were high school students at the time. I was like 17. Most of my uh, classmates were like 15, 16. So we needed a lot of like guidance. And sooner or later, I received actually emails and texts and just outreach from other students in other high schools in the Madison area, such as East, La Follette, West, who also wanted to participate in creating this climate strike. I didn't know at the time that there was something ongoing already. So we just got together. And even though we did not know each other, uh, we started really planning this whole March. And we had so many activities and we had so many ideas. It was just youth led. We really just wanted to bring forward our preoccupations with climate change because we as young people cannot just, um, you know, live on the fact that yes, I will go to college, I can become more educated. That's not feasible no more. We have tipping points. We have 2030 and 2050. And some of us belong to certain communities where those identities have been oppressed. And we live in systems such as capitalism, sexism, white supremacy that continue till this day to affect us. And so while we did all this work, um, it was a total huge success. Thank goodness. We were all so nervous about it. And a lot of people in the Madison community came. There was like a thousand people or so. And since then, we just realized that, you know, it's more than just a strike. It is a community where we are, we want to mobilize youth voices to be able to tell their legislators, tell the decision makers that we need to bring change now we cannot just initiate conversation. We cannot just stand still and call it a meeting one-on-one. No, it had to continue now and had to be taken to the level we're gonna need to divest as soon as possible. Um, and so ever since the Youth Climate Action Team has become a nonprofit here in Madison. We definitely had counter protesters. And the one good thing was that we had some adults in this area specifically to help us. Um, so they de deviated that bad energy and all this like criticism that older adults were like, you know, telling younger like high school kids like you're being brainwashed by liberalism and things like that. Like this is non-existent, blah, 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 blah. And we just, we didn't want to deal with it. We wanted to do our thing and that's it. Um, but I would say for the most part, the Madison community was so happy to see that youth was taking initiative and especially youth in high school. Because normally you tend to see this sort of um, awakening in high, like in college, 
right? You become more informed among other uh, reasons, but it was in high school, you know, students were still, you know, trying to get that high school degree. And we were already thinking of worldwide problems that we know are interconnected, uh, that are complex, such as climate change that is so multifaceted. We learn along the way. We didn't have these questions at first. And so first, we, we didn't decided to do certain demands that we thought were so important to address. And if the conversation was not initiated and the research was not being done, then they would have not been addressed at all. For instance, in like the climate change uh, task force report, like I really was like hammering those aspects of like social justice, of racial justice, of mental health. And so YCAT also wanted to divest. That was one of our biggest demands by 2030. Uh, declare a state of emergency. Um, we wanted to also expand climate change education across the state, but also not make it into something that Students who are already stressed and their mental health could be, you know, compromised by a topic such <laughs> heavy to understand, uh, you know, so we want it to be comprehensible and not taxing uh, for a senior to not graduate. It should not be taken in that form. Um, uh, along the topic of trusting adults or like knowing who to reach out to, um, we wanted to keep most of the work being done by us because we are a new generation. And while we appreciate the work that um, can be done along with adults, we also believe that in high school, it just felt like a lot of times we were being incorporated into projects just because we were young people. And so, you know, they were taking the picture like, oh, look, we did a project with them, but not much more to be taken seriously in the table to discuss about ideas. And so, when we actually wanted to talk to adults, we reached out. No. Yeah, I appreciate those questions because um, with all this thinking about our role, whether it's gonna be taken seriously at the table um, and whether you know we can actually afford waiting, which is in my opinion, not feasible, not uh, practical at all. Uh, we also thought a lot in YCAT about who is being represented. And so we were very conscious about how the environmentalist movement have been a lot of times uh, a narrative just told by Caucasian members in our society. When in reality, it was first initiated by black and indigenous leaders who till this day are fighting to like for basic rights regarding the environment. And we are pushing forward this legislation that is to, to some, too ambitious, too ambitious, but in reality, it's the bare minimum. It's the bare minimum of what we could be doing. Mental health, like we have seen it all, and some of you may have also experienced it, um, is such an important thing to consider when we go through pandemics, for instance, like this one. A lot of more people were experiencing anxiety, depression, and traumatic events happen uh, over the summer with now having Black Lives Matter uh, issues more covered by media when they should have been have uh, more coverage by media such a long time ago. But all these things are still affecting people and trauma. And so it would be, it would be awesome, for instance, just like the same way we have like yearly check, checkups on our body also have yearly checks up, checkups on our mind. If we could just visit once a year a psychologist, a therapist, and tell us like, really like, how you been doing? Do you wanna follow up? Do you really feel okay at home, safe at home? You know, like taking more initiative that, um, on that side that if your mind is healthy, your body's healthy too, and then you can heal on your own. is really um, such a broad question, like you said, right? Because a lot of people want to take the initiative and do nothing bad about it, but they just don't know how. You know, being inclusive, 
isn't always an easy tactic. Even implementation, even um, just keeping up with uh, just being inclusive is tasking. And as it should be, because we have to have everybody on the table. Otherwise, we will not be able to accurately implement solutions that can you know, not be a one size fit all, but be the close, closest approximation to what a solution that we can have as a society. Um, so in the regards of youth, this is a conversation I've had with other organizations where they have asked us, how can we best involve youth? Um, and I guess my recommendation number one is empower, empowerment. So whenever youth is being invited to converse on the table um, or just take, you know, uh, be able to give their initiatives and insights regarding a problem or solution, they should be allowed, you know, to have some power in decision-making. They should be allowed to know what um, they are expecting and know that they're not just being tokenized, you know, for that one good picture so the organization looks good and in the media. No, it's like actually a collaboration, it's a group project between everybody. Um, lastly, I would also ask, such as like the Youth Climate Action Team, they always ask us like, how can we best get involved with you guys? And we believe through projects. We don't love, we don't, it's not that we don't like, but we prefer not to partner up with an organization because we uh, want to be able to freely um communicate, explain what we want to demand from our uh, leader decision or decision makers. And we don't wanna constrain um, the business in, in case that business is trying to remain nonpartisan or whatsoever that the case may be, right? Um, I think those are the biggest two tactics. And then to give outreach, I think it's so interesting like to think about youth, uh, like activists and like climate activists because it's so scarce like we said we need such a urgent like it's like a demand for students to be educated on climate change and that is not widespread around the state so how do we expect a lot of like youth climate activists to show up especially if we're talking about different identities uh, marginalized identities you know BIPOC LGBTQIA and all this Interse intersectionality of identities that we need to have in order to fulfill that conversation of a complete circle. Um, so I would suggest first and foremost to look up your local organizations, such as could be a high school club of green initiatives, or it could be a nonprofit like Youth Climate Action Team nearby and request like, uh, a meeting and taking seriously their time because all the time that these um, students spend on something is valuable. I remember back in high school, I was doing seven or eight clubs and I was taking seven or eight classes. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> now I, I can just barely take two and I still need a nap. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's like time is valuable and I think it should be, you know, managed as, um, almost adult-like, uh, we have this one chant that says like, um, we have to start calling out adults, otherwise we are gonna start acting like adults uh, in the room. And I just think it's powerful to say that this work, you know, has to be um, equitable and has to be considered from all playing fields. I think is really valuable actually when organizations uh, reach out to us and tell us like, hey, um, we're offering your um, our support to your demands, to your initiatives by being a resource. So whenever you need, for instance, funding, it could be or sound equipment, or it could be a, a space, a platform to discuss about something, just send us an email, we can have a conversation about it. That's a good way to establish in relationships and networking. Secondly, uh, I also believe how climate activists would want to have a say in how a project is being built up. Because I think like, you know, as much as we want to say like, oh, we try to be 
as inclusive as, as, as we could and like try to incorporate every um, possible scenario. It's also important how to like have that youth perspective and be like, oh, can we like do pronouns, you know, in the beginning of the slideshow? Or it was like actually someone, um, a, uh, what is it called, a youth? A young person who uh, proposed the land, ac land acknowledgement here at UW-Madison. So in some classes you would hear, you know, today we are having discussion. However, we must remain um, in constant reminder that we are standing on ho stolen whole chunk land and all those forms of like just being aware is such a powerful way to involve also young people. So I would I would actually suggest like at the beginning stages, as you said, Nathan, like uh, when a project is being like thought about and being built up, probably would be a good way to like a good sick way to be um, establishing conversations in a relationship with young uh, org leaders. And this, I think, an ongoing um, type of question that will have different responses as time passes, right? And so I think what young people would like to see is for doctors to, to like take a stand. And, you know, as, as um, Andrew said, like doctors are someone who society um, have high numbers of trust. And so if your doctor were to tell you like, climate change is a real issue and it could affect your health or a community's health or somewhere else's health uh, within the next 10 or even now of years. Uh, it's such a powerful statement for a community to realize like, wow, if my own doctor said that and then given like statistics, so giving updates about it and then showing up cases, you know, and being able to engage in like policy and being able to say like, see, you guys don't have to deal with the patients that I have um, that may have asthma or all the patients that were affected by flooding and whatsoever, whatever the case may be. But I'm telling you my perspective because I think it's important to consider health, especially health. And we're in a pandemic. How can we not think about that? <laughs> uh, lastly, um, I think doctors do uh, have to consider the inter intersection intersectionality. Uh, just like Andrew said, you know, I, I, I'm really amazed actually that you guys have an anti-racism um, like subgroup because I know um, or we have seen actually in the black community, the statistics, how it shows that they're disproportionately being um, affected by mal practice, what is that called, um, by uh, just the health industry. Um, and I think that's something very important to address because if your climate justice work does not include social justice, that is not climate justice work. Just the level that we have been informing climate change, we can grasp this ideas of non-returning points that if we don't really like address at the moment drastically, there is no other way around. And we know that the most vulnerable people will be affected the most. And I think all these trends happen for two reasons. One, people are not educated as much as we want about climate change. You know, like, of course, um, if you think about it, nowadays climate or like education is a privilege. It's not given to everybody, it's not given, um, it's not accessible to everybody all around the world. Um, secondly, I would also say that we are also very complacent. We would like to feel um, not uncomfortable. And the reality of climate change is that the biggest contributors come from first, first world nations. And on top of that, we don't wanna address the fact that it's like there's tipping points that we have to do something as a first, first world nation now that we have the resources compared to third world countries to actually, you know, con like start that change. And when we have this conversation about climate change, we don't have tipping points because people want to feel like, oh, you know, like it's something that we can do more at the individual level, which we can surely do, but 
we have to take it at the community, at the global level, because all these tipping points will involve everybody. And so I encourage you all, you know, to go out of your comfort zone and talk about climate change, even when it doesn't have a happy ending at the moment, because we can have that happy, happy ending in the future. But at that moment, it just doesn't seem there's a light um, under the tunnel if we don't take drastic actions into divestment, for instance. It's hard, as you said, it's the lack of education that uh, many people just resort uh, or they seclude back to their old ways of living. That's what they have known, that's what they have been told to do. Like get married, get a house and good, find a good like school district. But no one did knew that you could do so much more and people constantly be saying like, I'm just one person, like what difference am I gonna make if I recycle, you know, like, Yes, I'm always demanding for systematic change, but if a lot of people think like that one, that one person, the free rider effect, or like that one person that, you know, benefits if everybody else does the job, will not be existent, is non-existent. And so when I am constantly like protesting and going out um, with friends and, um, you know, when that kind of work doesn't feel as impactful or not as meaningful, I always remind them, like, at least, at least you could say now that you protested, you could say now that you try, at least now you could say that I did it for my grandkids. I did it for my kids. I did it for my grandfathers. I did it for my parents. I did it for myself because I respect myself. And so if I have the resources, if I have now the privilege to go outside and make a sacrifice of my time, you know, to go out and get solar panels, get um, good filtration system uh, within water or just um, heat protection within your household so no heat is like wasted. If I can do those simple changes when, within my life, like you said, I will be making a difference where I can say at least I tried. Because by 2030 and 2050, if we're battling for uh, potable water, for food access, especially healthy food access among meat, meat production, not, not everyone will be able to eat meat. We have to find new ways of getting our protein. Then again, you will not regret what you, everything you could, could have done at that moment. And I think that's what makes people think a lot like, wow like you know is it that serious and then that's when you can go and go on and explain about the facts the history and what has people endured in other countries and what we are so privileged that we don't endure here you know all these things that people hit at once and I understand that they're overwhelmed but just you know like that's the point where you have to be at peace with yourself and understand that this is a big issue that you can address. You know, we all wish we could all say like, I'm a superhuman, I just need coffee and I can get up every day and go on about my patients. It must be so cool to be a doctor or a nurse like, <laughs> and explain to them. Uh, you know, what they can do to get better and things like that, but we're not. We're human beings that can make mistakes. We're human beings that need motivation. We're human beings that need love and deserve love. I'm someone who experienced uh, anxiety, and so I have a therapist, for instance, and she has to constantly remind me to not overbook myself. She has to constantly remind me to um, the fact that I can't be everywhere at every time and talk about something like climate change um, all the time because it can be you know draining and so I think a good way to put it uh what my recipe has been to get me better better <laughs> than um has been contacting my roots whatever that may look for you and so I contact my parents and they tell me this little stories from when uh we were in Honduras when they were growing up in Honduras and they lived through a struggle, but I'm always inspired how they overcame those struggles. And my parents have been always very serious person to have 
uh, expect a lot from me and my sister. And so even though that has put some pressure on me and my sister a lot, uh, it has been immensely um, propelling to tell us like, you can do this. And if you want to do poli-sci and environmental studies and not a doctor, engineer, lawyer, <laughs> that's okay too. You know, we will be here for you. Secondly, has been like, you know what they say, like, mind is first the mind, then the body. And so addressing what's inside, taking your meditation, doing something to take care of yourself. Self-love, I, I really truly believe that. Self-love is an act of rebellion because social media is telling you, oh, you're not that pretty, you are this, you are that, or you need to be doing this, you should be more productive. And you are a dad, a mom, or, or a parent simply. And you wish you could do all your roles perfectly at all times. And then you feel such like terrible and a failure if you cannot fulfill all those roles, but you need time for yourself. And so whatever that may be, you know, getting um, that one meal that you really like, going on a bike ride, how you used to do it in your college year, such a long time ago, <laughs> whatever that case may be. Uh, I think those two tactics have really helped me to stay motivated, especially during this pandemic.